Welcome everybody to um, both to all of you here at uh, UAW and of course to all of you at the uh, other nodes who are joining us on Zoom. Um, I can't actually see any of you so I'm kind of talking into the ether here. Um, so hopefully my audience here will give us appropriate smiles and laughs and whatever but I can see uh, I guess here on the on the computer screen I can start to see that we've got, um, I guess now, how many, Gordon? We've gone up to 60 participants. So that's, we just counted as one. So that's 60 plus all of you. So that's a, a great um, crowd to have. But what I guess is this final uh, ACES full centre meeting. Um, today we're going to uh, uh, start off with a, a great session from um, uh, a variety of senior researchers in ACES. Uh, Gordon's going to give us an introduction in a, a minute or so, and then we're going to follow that with a, a, a break at 3.25 for coffee, and then at 3.40, uh, Jenny's going to take the next session, which will go through till 5 o'clock today. Um, and at 6 o'clock, for those of us here, we're, we're off to dinner, and we hope that uh, all of you who are not here will join us for dinner in spirit. Uh, at home, you can think of us all having a great time, yes. Um, and uh, we, we shall all be thinking of you locked up there in Melbourne and other places. Um, so I just wanted, before we went today, just to have a quick history lesson, particularly for the younger of those of, among the audience who may not quite recall where ACES came from, and Gordon may go through some of this. Um, so I just put up three very quick slides here of the original proposals for ACES, and in fact, the first proposal was put through in about um, 2003 and was successful, and it became what was known as the Australian Centre for Nanostructured Electromaterials, and Gordon and Doug and, and Maria and others will remember us putting this together. Um, and as much as anything, just focus on the, um, the structure on the right there, which shows you how poor our graphics were in those days and how they improved over these three slides. Um, but just notice that this was called Acne. We were a young centre then, obviously, with pimples. And um, so that's what we were for two years, for 2003 to 2005. Um, and we were exploring electromaterials um, at, the, at the nano level, um, looking at electron and charge transfer as it states there. Um, as we got to 2005, we... Uh, we turned into the uh, into what's now ACES, but actually very few people recall or remember that this was ACES doesn't actually stand for the ARC Centre. It actually stands for the Australian Centre for Electromaterial Science. And of course, it's a title that's never been used because we call ourselves the ARC Centre of Excellence for Electromaterial Science. But it's interesting, this was what was on the application and what went through. Um, and you see our graphics got a little bit better. And uh, for those of you that remember also, we went from 2005 to 2010, and then we were renewed for three years as that first centre of ACES. And then very quickly, our, our graphics improved again, and we got to where we are now. You can see that things have got a lot more sophisticated um, and has brought us to where we are today. So behind all of your, um, I guess, careers to date has been this incredible uh, journey, uh, which is now, what, 17 years. So it's been really amazing. Um, and so I'll now ask Gordon if he would like to, uh, I guess, introduce our full centre me. Thanks, Tim. Give him a clap. Oh. <laughs> I don't dare do it unless I push the wrong button and the whole thing falls over. Well, thanks, thanks, David. Uh, welcome, everyone, and uh, welcome, everyone, online as well. Uh, so, as David says, we've been kicking around for quite a while. I just should clarify that that first centre didn't, that ACME didn't actually get Centre of Excellence funding. Uh, we did get some funding from the ARC, and so we, at least amongst us, called ourselves a centre of mediocrity uh, rather than a centre of, of excellence. But we did eventually grow into a, a centre of excellence. So look, our, our annual reports, and if you haven't seen this year's, here it is. Uh, Lauren's got some. If you need to get one to send to your mom, your dad, or you know, your in-laws and outlaws, get a hold of it. This will be our last uh, ACES annual report. Uh, so, so please do get one if you, if you want one. 
Um, and it, those annual reports, if you look back over the years, well, uh, welcome Steve, and nice to see you get Megan. <laughs> <laughs> it's a live event, mate. People know when you're left now. <laughs> uh, so if those annual reports contain all of the statistics that you'd ever want uh, to read about uh, and all the amazing outcomes from uh, ACES over the years in terms of publications, in terms of research training, uh, and in terms of commercialization and, and translation, they're, are all recorded uh, in those annual reports. What's not so well documented and what's really very difficult to document is the number of people that ACES has actually influenced and helped to develop. Literally hundreds of people over that 17 year period uh, have been trained, have worked as part of ACES in all sorts of different areas. Uh, that's right across uh, research, uh, science communications, our administration uh, team within ACES and of course our commercialization teams uh, and, and all of those have delivered above and beyond what we set out to deliver back in those early days and, and, and all of those people, those hundreds of people uh, over that long period of time have go on, gone on to do some amazing things. Some have stayed here to do amazing things in new research ventures, uh, others have gone outside of ACES to set up new companies, uh, to work in IP protection firms, uh, to work in new commercialization uh, activities with, with other uh, established firms, for example, uh, and also to go on to look at careers in uh, science communication. So the one thing that's true across all of those different types of people and those different types of activities that they've pursued is that we all have benefited greatly uh, from the opportunity to participate in ACES. Uh, for better or for worse, you all come out the other end of ACES looking different. Uh, some of it's better, some of it's worse, as I said. Uh, but we all come out with very different skills, and maybe skills that we didn't think we would acquire uh, when we uh, entered into the whole ACES program. But, but those skills and that ability to work across interdisciplinary teams, not just interdisciplinary from a technical point of view, but interdisciplinary from a non-technical point of view, like communication and commercialization skills, uh, have set us all up to be able to do better in terms of identifying important and critical areas of research, in terms of executing critical areas of research, and in terms of translating that research uh, back into the big challenges in energy and health and back into the communities that we all set out, out to work for. So it's been, it has been quite a journey uh, and we should all be thankful for it. Uh, of course, it will continue. Uh, the, the, the last six months of this year will be incredibly exciting and there'll be other activities that will roll in for next year. Uh, many are involved in the development of a new centre of excellence proposal. Many are involved in other big research programs that have come out uh, of ACES over the last uh, period of time. So this full centre meeting is a bit different. Uh, half of our colleagues are, are online uh, on the Zoomer, where half of us are here, some others are distributed around uh, Wollongong as well. Uh, so it's, it's different in that regard, it's fully online. It's also different in the fact that it's open access and it's different because it's the only final meeting of ACES that we're ever going to have. Uh, and so but that's exciting in itself. Uh, we, we should look back and celebrate uh, what we have achieved together, uh, all of us here and all of our colleagues online. And, and we, look short, we should look forward to see how we're going to utilise all of those things that have been achieved and how we're going to make sure we return the maximum impact and the maximum engagement uh, for those communities. So I'd just like to thank uh, everybody who's put the program together over the next two days. There's no less work in putting together a program for online uh, as there is face to face. So thank you to all who've been involved in that organisation. And, and the next two days are really about a celebration, a celebration of individuals who have been associated with ACES, a celebration of individuals who are now associated with ACES and who will be associated with ACES as we move forward. So I'm looking forward to an exciting program. It's been a great journey so far. I'm sure it'll continue and I'd like to thank all of you right from the start for being part of that journey and being a very significant contributor uh, to that journey. Thanks. All right, thanks very much, Gordon. And we'll now begin our session one. Um, our first speaker today is Dr. Anita Quigley at the University of Melbourne in Australia. So she'll be on our screen um, here. And Anita's sharing her slides. 
Um, so Anita's in the SBS theme, and she's going to talk to us today about brains and brawn, engineering neural and muscle tissues. Anita, it's over to you. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, can you all hear me? Yep, all good, Anita. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Um, look, thanks for the opportunity to speak at the um, ACES Centre meeting. Um, I haven't been up to Wollongong in a while. I'm actually really missing all of you guys up, up there, but um, in the interest of time, I'll get going. So I'm just going to talk about some of the activities uh, that we were doing as part of the ACES and some of our ongoing activities in this area as well. Um, so I've moved on to RMIT University. I'm a um, VC Senior Research Fellow in Biomedical Engineering there now where I'm continuing some of this work. So I'm going to be talking today, just make sure I can get the slides to advance, there we go, um, about two projects that we were doing, looking at skeletal muscle engineering as well as some neural tissue engineering. So um, one of the things that we were doing is using biomaterials and using some of the hydrogels that have been developed up in ACEs, particularly GELMA, for engineering 3D uh, skeletal muscle structures. Um, additionally, we've been doing some work on neural tissue engineering ex vivo, having a look at the difference between functional activity in two, 2D and three-dimensional uh, neural cultures, with an aim to take this towards 3D modelling of various neurological diseases with a little bit of a focus on epilepsy. So I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Okay. So most of the work on uh, the tissue engineering of muscle that I'm talking about today, pretty much actually all of it has been performed by Catherine, our wonderful PhD student um, who's handed in. Um, and we've got quite a few publications with Catherine as well as Rob, who was her other supervisor. So um, there's been a lot of work done on the tissue engineering of skeletal muscle. Um, one of the main uh, things with skeletal muscle is that it has got linear linearity. So it's a linearly orientated type of tissue. Where you've got muscle fibers, uh, I don't know if you guys can see my pointer, but where you've got muscle fibers that lie in parallel to each other. So this lend, lends itself very well to um, various biofabrication methods, including bioprinting, which is what Catherine looked at, where we can create um, orientated um, strands of hydrogel that can, can uh, that contain skeletal muscle progenitors for muscle engineering. So keep going. So we use Gelma um, in some of our studies, uh, some of the Gelma that's been produced uh, by Sanji up in Wollongong. And we loaded those up with um, highly myogenic uh, skeletal muscle primary cells. Um, now these myogenic cells, generally you see about 80 of them, 80% of them fusing into mature muscle fibers. Um, so that's considered fairly highly myogenic. And they can be characterized by, you know, looking at expression of various markers associated with these types of cells, including PAX7. So the, this population's got a very high percentage of PAX7 population positive cells. So essentially what we did is um, she, she was loading up the gelatin uh, with about, I think, 30 million cells per mil um, and cross-linking them in uh, gelma to see how they behave. So we initially saw that the primary encapsulated myoblast proliferate, migrate and fuse and differentiate in the gelma no problem. We did have to optimize the protocol a little bit, particularly around the uh, cross-linking time and the percentage of cross-linker that we used. Um, and we did see that the cells seemed to migrate out of the gel after a period of time as well, which was, which was very interesting. So at 14 days, we did see really good differentiation um, of the primary encapsulated myoblast into muscle fibers. Okay, so then we went, she went on to do some bioprinting with these using the usual methods. Um, we've got an incredible class down in Melbourne that we use for the bioprinting and then uh, basically conducted the cross-linking as we worked out in the previous protocol. Yeah, just move on from there in the interest of time. And after we bioprinted the constructs, um, after seven days of myoblast prol proliferation and seven days of differentiation, we saw expression of some markers that are associated with more mature muscle fibers, which was very promising. So, and again, we saw my blast fusion that tended to occur on the surface of the printed constructs. And then when you actually had a look within 
the inside onto some confocal microscopy on the inside of the printed strands that you can see here. At seven days, we still saw quite a few myoblasts within the printed strands. But by day 14, most of those were gone and we had mature muscle fibres on the outside of the constructs. So it seemed to us that the cells might be migrating to the periphery of the, periphery, periphery of the printed constructs and where they could undergo differentiation. So after that, we did a little bit of functional testing. It wasn't spectacular, but we did see some calcium fluxes uh, in the myotubes after we did the bioprinting and the differentiation. Like I said, it wasn't spectacular, but it looked like they were actually still functional and still alive to some degree. We expect Generally, you expect to see much higher calcium transients and mature muscle fibres than this, but that's okay. We also had a look at some uh, electrical activity in the printed constructs, and we did see some spiking um, from the when we laid down the printed constructs, some uh, multi-channel electrode arrays. So again, that was promising. It looked like we had some functional activity from the printed constructs. So we decided, okay, well, you know, we can clearly use the hydrogel bioprinting to create these 3D muscle scaffolds. But, um, you know, we really need to actually have a look at what these do in vivo and see if this particular technique could be useful in vivo. So we went in vivo. So we use this particular um, chamber that we use for implantation into rats where we can take the printed construct, which is this little waffle you can see here, um, and bring in the femoral nerve, femoral artery and femoral vein, connect them up. Basically what that we want to do with that is actually provide some vascularization to the printed construct. And we bring in the femoral nerve to bring in a little bit of innovation as well. So they're implanted into the groin of rats. So I won't go through this in detail in the interest of time, but we did a lot of testing with the Med610. That's the uh, polymer that we used to make the constructs. And we found that the um, using the manufacturer cleaning protocol, we got lots of dead cells. So we had to come up with our own cleaning protocol. Um, so you can't always necessarily go by what the manufacturer tells you. With some of these materials, you need to test it for yourself and see whether it actually meets your requirements. So we came up with a protocol uh, that cleaned up the Med610 construct significantly and we got really good viability. Um, we also did some testing in vivo as well um, with the Med610 and showed that our cleaning protocol um, significantly reduced the foreign body response in vivo. So I go on. So we took these chambers, sorry about the gory pictures. <laughs> we took the chambers, put the um, cell laden uh, printed construct in the chambers, implanted them into rats. And this is just what it looks like at day zero. These chambers and printed constructs were implanted into new rats. Um, at 14 days, this is what the inside of the chamber looks like. And we tried some electrophysiological recordings and we got some unclear results. Um, so I won't discuss those. And then we removed the tissue from within the chamber for histological analysis. So what we did see, which was really promising, was large areas of muscle regeneration within the, con within the chamber. This is what normal skeletal muscles should look like. You can see all of the muscle fibers aligned. Um, this is a cross section of the muscle fibers. And we saw something very similar in various spots in the implanted um, construct. Um, there's a lot of gelmer still present, we think, and through this gelmer as well. Um, and through the printed construct, we could see evidence of vascularization that would have come from the femoral artery and the femoral um, vein that we uh, laid over the printed construct. We saw evidence of innovation as well. And we definitely saw nice mature fibers. You can see the striation and some of the fibers that you can see here. So um, basically in conclusion, uh, you know, we could actually take a 3D printed construct and we could implant it into an animal. And it, it seemed, we seemed to be getting some integration with vasculature and neural supply in vivo, which was promising. So I'll just move on to the other aspect of our work too that we've been doing. So we've been doing some work on additionally looking at neural modeling in two dimensions versus three dimensions, uh, where we're wanting to develop engineered 3D structures by using various hydrogels where we can develop rapid functional neural models. So um, some of the work we did back in, two, that was published in about 2017 was taking, uh, 
hippocampal cultures from rat pups and having a look at the difference in uh, uh, functional activity in two dimensions and three dimensions and some work that Justin did early on was looking at uh, these cultures, like, as I said, um, in two dimensions on multi-electrodes arrays. And then we were growing the same cells of the same population of cells in 3D hydrogels and comparing the activity after a period of time with these two dimensional constructs. And what we saw was uh, significant differences in the type of activity that you could see in two dimensions and three dimensions. We were seeing kind of um, more bursting activity. I wouldn't really call these bursts though. They're not huge bursts, but we were seeing what looked like bursting activity in the three dimensions, whereas we weren't seeing that so much in the two dimensions. And this is more akin to what you actually see in the body or in the brain. So um, this is just a, another picture of the same results here. And just a picture of our two dimensional hippocampal cultures and three dimensional hippocampal cultures here. So we're tending to see brain more brain like activity in the three dimensional cultures, which I guess is not that surprising. So, what we're currently doing is we're moving on now to an epilepsy model. So, with some of our collaborators at the Children's Hospital, we've got uh, induced pluripotent stem cells from patients that have early onset childhood epilepsies. And we've been looking at doing some initially some cortical organoid cultures to look at the development of the aberrant activity or the epileptic activity with time. So this is essentially what you can see here. This is a little cortical organoid um, growing in, essentially it's like a three dimensional culture. Um, and we've been laying down those on multi electrode arrays and recording the activity from those. Um, you can see some of the spiking or that some of the recorded activity here. So what we've seen so far is that we're getting aberrant activity in the epileptic organoids, particularly at early stages. And now what we're doing is we're moving on and actually integrating this model into our 3D neural hydrogel um, model that we developed using the rat um, hippocampal neuronal cultures. Okay. So in summary, we can print the muscle progenitors into 3D bioprinted um, uh, constructs, and these seem to actually do fairly well in vivo. And we're still currently working on our 3D neural constructs. And we're hoping to get a publication out later this year on that, integrating these cultures into 3D engineered models based on some of our animal models and comparing how these 3D models, how these engineered models compare with organoid type systems. And luckily we've been able to secure some NHMRC funding to continue this work. Okay, um, yep, lots of people to thank, uh, particularly Catherine, Rob, Alex, our associates at the Children's uh, down in Melbourne, and um, thanks very much for your attention today. Okay, thanks very much, Anita. Now, in the interest of time, we're going to uh, ask you if you have any questions for Anita to put them on the chat and she can uh, look at those chat questions and respond. So we'll move on. Um, so please join with me in thanking Anita once again. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Vipul Gupta from the University of Tasmania in Australia. Uh, he's Vipul's part of the um, electrofluidics and diagnostics theme and he's going to talk to us today about 3D printing of PDMS glass and silica based ceramics. People, can you turn your camera on so we can see you at all? Yep. I'm just gonna see if I'm just gonna see if we can get you on the screen. Just there you are. Yeah. That's not good. You need to speak people and then we'll get you back on the screen. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, but <laughs> we've lost you again. No, that wasn't him. No, we can. There he is. There he is. Thank you. Yes, we can. That's great. All right, you can um, put your put your presentation on slide mode and um, and go go ahead. I hope everything is working. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, David. So, um, for those who don't know me, my name is Vipul Gupta. I am an ARC DECRA fellow here at the University of Tasmania, and I'm working with EFT team of ACES. 
the proposed title of my talk was 3D printing of PDMS glass and other silicon-based ceramics. But in line with the theme and spirit of this last FCM, you know, full center meeting for ACES, I tried to pivot my talk to reflect some of our journey on how we got to 3D printing these materials and tell the story behind it because the story has uh, translation to its guide, guide rail. So hopefully there will be something for everyone in there. So you might remember that when I got involved with ACES, I started 3D printing various microfluidic devices and components, and we were able to 3D print one of the first metal liquid chromatographic column. Then we also went ahead and developed different stationary phases in, on those columns, did high performance liquid chromatographic separations, we studied for the first time studied the effect of different column geometries and saw how 3D printing can be used not only for fundamental research where we can estimate the effect of different column geometries on separation capabilities, but also develop strong metal chromatographic columns which can be used in real life applications and how we can use 3D printing to break the boundaries of conventional manufacturing and develop radically new designs for various applications such as chemical sense detection and how these new designs can improve the performance of conventional optical systems and the work also got highlighted in some of the science magazines and recently we have developed quite complex microfluidic systems again using polyjet printing where we have developed bifurcating microfluidic distributors in a three-dimensional spaced uh, architecture and we have used these distributors to develop multi-element columns, solid phase extraction systems, etc. So working on these for a few years, we were able to develop more than 2025 20, microfluidic components. Most of them were thoroughly characterized and then published in high impact factor journals, but still they were sitting in our drawers. So we thought why not start a spin-off company? and start selling them online and see if there's any market for them. So we started this spin-off company called 3D Made, which is 3D printed miniaturized analytical devices. That's one way how we translated some of the work into a commercial product. But this was not the end of the story. This was pretty much the start of the story because when we set this up, when we started talking to customers and as we discussed in our panel discussion, Today, we started getting customer feedback and we started understanding what's the market pull, what the customer requires and so on and so forth. And that started shaping our future research. So there has been a company called Tell Lab in Ireland, which most of you might be familiar with. It has been working with Dread uh, for a couple of years. So we started talking to them and we envisioned that we might be able to use some of these 3D printed components in their analytical portable analytical system and develop a high efficiency analytical system for real time water monitoring. And we wrote this linkage grant, which got up. So currently we are working with them to develop a portable analytical system, which would feature some of these 3D printed components. But this system still heavily relies on conventional manufacturing and only uses few of these 3D printed components. So we also envisioned that we might be able to develop a micro total analysis system where everything is 3D printed. And we have already 3D printed most components required for such a system. So we wrote a DP and it got up. And so we are trying to develop a fully 3D printed micro total analysis system, which can perform a wide variety of analytical procedures. But while working with chemical, in if you are working with chemical systems such as these, and also if you look at the uh, market or customer feed, feedback in analytical chemistry, they require materials which are resistant to chemicals, resistant to temp high temperatures, biocompatible, etc. And till now we have been mostly working with materials which are acrylate or epoxy based, which are commercially available. And as Anita also pointed out, even if manufacturers suggest that a material is bulk compatible, such as MET 610. When we really look into it, it's really not. So that brought us to the idea of developing our own new materials, which have been conventionally used in subtractive manufacturing. 
and see if we can translate them for 3D printing. And one of, one that, one of that class is silicon-based materials such as PDMS, silica oxycarbide, silicon dioxide. These are some of the materials which have been conventionally and widely used in chemistry in various fields, even some of the fields which we as ACES have been working with, such as synthetic biosystems, electromaterials, et cetera. So that brought to my TECRA where I proposed the additive manufacturing of these materials. And then once that got up, I started working on these materials. And I will give you a brief overview of what we have been doing with these materials. And my apologies, since this is an open session, I cannot go into much detail on how we are doing it and what the raising compositions are, et cetera, because we are still in the process of protecting it. So bear with me there. So PDMS, we all know PDMS has been widely used in biotechnology, microfluidics, and various applications because of its unique properties such as biocompatibility, transparency, elasticity, and it can, to a certain degree, resist chemical and uh, thermal exposure. There have been few reports recently in attempts to 3D print PDMS, but most of those reports, and especially some of these, state-of-the-art reports, which I would like to consider, are based on acrylate chemistry. And acrylate chemistry suffers from few challenges such as oxygen inhibition and shrinkage post-curing being one of them. And this, uh, this uh, chemistry is, uh, is not a preferred method when you're trying to produce elastic components when you're trying to produce low shrinkage components. And that's why we started developing thiolene chemistry in our lab, which can resolve some of these issues associated with acrylate chemistry. However, thiolene chemistry suffers from very small shelf life because it can polymerize in the presence of minute heat, even in environment, it, it vitrify. Hence, we have developed processes, we have developed resins, which are based on thiolene chemistry. However, they have really long shelf life compared in the same lines as acrylate chemistry but they don't suffer oxygen inhibition or shrinkage. And also the resin which we have developed can be used with commercial SLA and direct print writing printers. So we have been, we can 3D print PDMS. Now we can print uh, mechanically robust PDMS. We can change their mechanical strength. We can change their transparency. We can use commercial SLA and direct print writing printers. Then, the other material which we have been interested in is silicon oxycarbide. Again, silicon oxycarbide has been well known for its thermal and chemical resistance. It has been used as a electromaterial because of its high electrical conductivity, because of the dispersed graphene sheets. Uh, recently, it has also attracted attention in biotechnology because of its biocompatibility. But again, if you look at some of the state-of-the-art literature, such as this science paper, they have relied on the use of low ceramic yield monomers, which again leads to high shrinkage. And when it results in such high shrinkage, it also results in defects and breakage and um, less output. If you try to print it 10 times, it might work five or six, which is not really commercially viable. And also most of the reports out there only deals with non-porous materials. So recently we have developed resins where we can Minimize the shrinkage. We have already minim we have already obtained structures with less than twenty percent shrinkage, and we are trying to push it forward. We can print porous and non-porous objects, and we can also modulate its carbon content. So we can pretty much predefine its electrical uh, conductivity and thermal and chemical resistance. And then moving on to one of the holy grails of material, which is porous silica. Because silica has been widely used in various applications, and if we can make multi-level porous silica, we have a high surface area to volume ratio, which can be used in various sectors such as energy, health, etc. It's biocompatible, has pretty high thermal and chemical resistance, and we can easily modify its surface using silent chemistry. And again, if you look at some of the recent papers, there is not a lot of literature report out there on 3D printing porous silica yet. There is a recent paper in Nature Materials last year, but these reports usually rely on the use of unstable monomers such as silanes, which are not 
uh, stable in their environment because they can hydro they can hydrolytically cleavage they have high toxicity and they lead to very high shrinkage such as 60 percent and the paper only discusses the incorporation of single type of pores and in our lab we have now developed monomers which are not toxic which are stable under environmental conditions they provide much less shrinkage compared to what's reported out there again we have managed to get to less than 40 percent shrinkage and we are pushing it forward and see how far we can go we can incorporate different levels of porosity ranging from micropores mesopores to macropores and we can also print multi-component glass using the technique which we have been using right now by incorporating different uh, oxides such as sodium oxide barium oxide etc and if we look at the commercialization metrics in line with Gary's presentation last week, I discussed some of the technical advantages which we have compared to some of the state-of-the-art technology available at the moment. In terms of cost, it's hard to estimate the exact cost at the moment because there are no commercially available raisins and we, neither we are at a stage of commercially producing them, but I envision that the cost of these raisins will be similar to what other literature report to the reasons what other literature reports have used, and it might be slightly higher based on the functionality we want to achieve. We want to achieve multiporosity or modulate carbon content, etc. In terms of patentability, I'm talking to the IP office in the Utah, and so far it seems we can patent these reasons, and I will keep you updated how it goes further. If you look at the opportunities and impact which this work creates in terms of opportunities, we are 3D printing very high surface area to volume ratio, such as multi-level porosity structures. And we are working with materials which are biocompatible, thermally and chemically resistant, electrically conductive. So we can envision there is an opportunity for wide range of collaborations with various research members who are already working with ACES in SPS, theme electrometers, et cetera, because these materials are widely used all across these areas. And if we can use these materials and develop those applications, the impact I feel would be strong in many of the research priorities of Australia where ACES is already playing a key role such as in additive manufacturing, health, energy, et cetera. With that, I would like to acknowledge some of the members who have been recently associated with this work, Brett, Atia, Ahmed, everyone at Utah's, Ross and ACES. And with that, I would like to thank you all for listening. And I'll be happy to take any questions depending on the time left. Yes. Hello. Thanks very much, Vipul. That was great. Look, there's a question from uh, Gerardo um, on the chat. Is it possible to print micro channels with the PDFs or only solid figures? Hi, Gerardo. Yes. So till now, we have only printed solid figures, but that's the next step we are getting into since we have been convincing with microfluidic. So that's our goal to print microfluidic structures with this PDMS. Okay, thanks, Vipul. We'll, we'll move on, but join with me, please, and thank you, Vipul, for an excellent presentation. So our next presentation is um, a local Wollongong uh, presentation from Dr. Eva Tomaskovic Crook, um, and she's going. To, she's in the SBS uh, theme, and she's going to talk about advanced electrical stimulation for human tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. Eva. Just a reminder while you're there, please ask people any questions on the chat that you have and you'll respond to those. Uh, 
Um, so the basis of introducing electrical stimulation into our uh, introducing electrical stimulation to our cells is to try to evoke native or innate um, uh, bioelectric signaling. So that in involves bioelectric signaling and electrogenetic signaling to advance visual engineering. So if we understand what bioelectrical signaling, what I mean by there. What we mean, okay. what we mean by that is that um, we're looking at the um, ion flux that occurs in terms of um, changes in um, cell membrane risk potentials and the expression of uh, or the changes in ion flux, the movements of ions across the cell membrane, and thus um, changes in voltage-gated ion channels. That bioelectric signaling occurs in um, parallel and in series with molecular and genetic changes which occur. That is the um, genes, the transcription factors and proteins which are expressed. And these proteins then lead to downstream um, regulation. And thus these systems um, run in parallel. So these changes in electrical potentials, um, if a, uh, or this, uh, this bioelectric signaling is an endogenous electrically mediated signaling system that results in changes in the cell membrane resting potential such that there is a hyperpolarized and depolarized state and these then regulate cell and tissue behavior so during embryonic and fetal development and during differentiation and in wound healing the understanding of the field of the uh, bioelectric signaling has been around for quite some time. It's been investigated since the 18th century, but actually to try and pin down how to look at these systems, because they're such a, a subtle measurement that we're trying to do, this has been very uh, problematic and, and challenging technically. More recently, the area has gained significant traction by looking at studies of, on the left-hand side, we look at studies in um, rock development, and on the right-hand side, we look at studies in the uh, flatworm. So specifically, um, at, on the left hand side, Tufts University, the, the um, normal um, embryonic brain development was looked at in a frog. Under the suppression of notch signaling, the um, loss of normal pat um, voltage patterning was affected such that the brain did not actually develop um, correctly. However, in, uh, through the addition of exogenous um, drugs, they were able to, and, and uh, um, RNA, they were able to rescue normal patterns of hyperpolarization in the, in the uh, brain, the development of the frog, and so um, highlight the um, uh, importance of bioelect bioelectrical signaling in um, uh, differentiation development of a, um, a frog brain. Similarly, in studies of the uh, worm, whether the head or the tail were hyperpolarized or depolarized, they were able to modify the different changes such that they could uh, result in a headless, a one-headed normal uh, flatworm or a two-headed animal. Um, so yet again, um, looking at the concept that local field potential stimulates neural differentiation and they're able to influence functional um, uh, neural networking and, and differentiation downstream. So we have previously been able to show the utility of our 3D um, cell laden biogel. The cell laden biogel incorporates uh, three uh, materials alginate, carboxymethylchitophan, and agarose. Alginate is specifically used for structural support, um, which uh, through the addition of a on a crosslinker, the material gelates. The carboxymethylchitazone is able to um, promote cell, cell survivability and porosity, and agarose accepts, uh, sorry, agarose um, uh, permits the printing of the um, biomaterial um, such that it's an increase the viscosity and it helps the structure during the printing itself. So using uh, introducing human neural stem cells into these three component material, we've been able to show the utility through um, differentiating these stem cells um, such that they are able to form the neurons, neurons and supporting your glia and able to also uh, show functional um, activity through um, stimulation via um, bicarbonate um, induced suppression of um, GABA receptor signaling. So 
Having taken that uh, work further, we, will, we then looked at um, incorporating, rather than human neural stem cells, we incorporated human induced pluripotent stem cells. These cells were able to um, uh, <coughs> differentiate um, or <coughs> form embryoid bodies, and they could also differentiate or um, uh, uh, progress to differentiating down the three germ lineages of the body. Having looked at the neural components of the differentiation, we're able to show that neuroids were able to um, uh, expand and uh, differentiate and expand and uh, 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 show functional collectivity between different uh, collections of neural um, differentiated cell populations. So, So incorporating the um, the uh, free system um, free material uh, uh, biolink with human neural stem cells will allow to introduce this into a um, a three dimensional uh, micro electrode array pillar system. The micro electrode pillar system is a small scale um, uh, uh, race pipe system, where uh, by the pillars themselves are um, are uh, electrode deposited onto gold um, uh, uh, substrates and then electroplymerized onto the surface, resulting in um, 80 micron sized pillars um, within about 100 microns uh, between each other in a six by six uh, pillars array structure. Thus, it formed a array system which was in the um, a biological scale context of of what be relevant relevant for um, differentiating cells um, down your own lineage. So the the uh, material, the um, human neural stem cell made in biomaterial, was introduced as we see in the middle right um, into a uh, micro electron array um, uh, location and then um, allowed to uh, in, uh, differentiate uh, for a period of three days and then in under the influence of electrostimulation we're able to look at the effects of, of stimulation over a, a further a few days and what we're able to show was that in the bottom left hand panel with electrostimulation we're able to show that the um, cells were um, expressing markers of, of uh, maturation such they express markers of MAP2 um, uh, microtubule associated protein um, synaptophysin was localized to these uh, MAP2 um, uh, expressed neurons, um, and also uh, an early marker, uh, tubulin 3, um, was expressed but did not co localize with the synaptophysin. This suggested that the maturation index of and the co localization of MAP2 synaptophysin was enhanced with the additional stimulation. However, in the absence of stimulation, the presence of these markers was diffused. So the cells were alive, they were there, but they were not actually um, showing functional um, uh, co localizational maturation. We also looked uh, pharmacologically was there an effect um, in terms of the um, activity, the functional neural activity of these cells? And what we found was with the addition of bicalculin that there was an enhanced amplitude and frequency of a stimulation of these cells uh, following electrostimulation um, and uh, following the uh, enhanced maturation that was also um, shown. We also um, were able to show the first that the material, the cell layer, cell layer biogel was um, electroactive, it was an ionic conductive hydrogel. And, was, um, so, and we were um, and with the addition of human neural stem cells, there was increased capacity with the within the biogel itself. So, so moving on from these original studies where we looked at wide or tethered electric stimulation um, to enhance maturation of these uh, neural tissues, we've progressed to looking at wireless uh, electric stimulation as a um, mode of, of, uh, of, uh, of transmission. So. Um, if we look at um, uh, ultrasound mediated piezoelectricity, we understand that ultrasound is able to 
um, mechanically stress the piezoelectric electric material, causing deformation and a charge generation um, in response to the uh, 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 ultrasound. The, um, the resultant um, uh, changes in um, charged uh, uh, species at the other end of the piezo or deformed piezoelectric nanomaterial, then in close um, proximity to the cell membrane, can cause changes in the ion channels such that they recreate a uh, flow of ions in or out of the cell. These biological effects, that is the depolarization of polarization, um, then can, uh, can have downstream um, biological effects for actually change the differentiation. It's interesting also to note that ultrasounds alone can also um, activate stress uh, sensitive voltage gated ion channels, and these have been, are currently being investigated by others for treatment of brain disorders such as Alzheimer's and through transcranial, transcranial pulse stimulation. So, some of our work um, has uh, involved introducing um, the piezoelectric response of nanomaterials um, as a film, or where the cells are then deposited onto the um, as a film or can incorporate these nanoelectric nano uh, um, electric nanoparticles into their uh, into their uh, um, uh, uh, into their cell membrane. So if we look on the left, we see a two-dimensional model where in the bottom left-hand side there's appearance of, of large tracts of uh, concentrated differentiated um, uh, um, neurons. That uh, when we compare the uh, electrostimulators versus non stimulators, or ultrasound uh, stimulated versus non stimulated um, uh, uh, cells, we can see that there's enhanced uh, uh, activity, enhanced maturation of these, of these tissues. On the right hand side, we also, as I mentioned, incorporated into a more three dimensional model. Um, the nanomaterials into uh, 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 collections of cells, and and again, we have to show that there was enhanced maturation such that the um, neuronal to glial cell population was um, elevated following electric stimulation. We also were able to show that the material itself is compatible; it has um, minimal effects on viability, and um, thus it was not a, a Hampering uh, uh, contributing factor. So, so um, these uh, studies were also um, uh, were also followed up with functional network activity, such that we're showing that by calculin we can by calculin can increase. Oh, sorry, with the addition of by calculin, we're able to show increased global network connectivity. So rather than a shift from isolated network firing. There was uh, increased um, cell maturation. And just moving finally to the summary slides. Um, in summary, <coughs> we were able to show that the problem that's uh, incorporating ultrasound mediated gas electric material into three dimensional tissues, a promising platform for building 3D electric tissues, supports maturation, and this um, can be taken beyond the neurological. Um, uh, a context to non neurological tissue development and dysfunction. The work has gone on through to NHMRC funding, patent, provisional, granted, and fellowship, and further collaborations. And Andreas will be um, talking about our training, which is some of the work that we've been doing here. So, finally, just want to acknowledge everyone for their help. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Eva. Um, there's no question yet on the chat, so I'll ask if anybody here in the live audience would like to uh, ask you a question at all. If not, does uh, anybody else online like to ask a question? There's a comment here, an anonymous comment, nice talk, Eva. So <laughs> obviously, they didn't want to reveal who they were. <laughs> anyway, all right, if not, then please join with me in thanking Eva once again. So our next speaker um, today is Dr. Andrus Ruland, uh, 
from the University of Wollongong here. Um, and he's going to talk about the, uh, as Eva suggested, the ultra image, a versatile platform for the non invasive imaging of biomaterials and cell containing structures. Well, yours. Okay, well, hello everybody. Uh, so, as introduced, I will be talking today on ultra image. And uh, in this last uh, meeting, this, uh, I would like to showcase all the work done in, in this field um, over the last uh, four years, uh, which back then we identified with us some as a suitable technique for the evaluation of biomaterials, but uh, there was, uh, we didn't have much background, we didn't talk around this, so it's a great satisfaction to this week and yeah, I'm showing you all the work done in, in this uh, field. So the background of the idea of, of this new ultrasound is based on the fact that conventional instrumentation in biofragmentation uh, rely on optic based techniques. Um, these are always preferred by biologists because of the high resolution and high specificity. However, this brings a, a fundamental limitation for the non invasive and volumetric monitoring of other bioscopies during maturation. And this is uh, due because um, optic based techniques often require the use of additives. Uh, these are difficult to apply in highly scattered uh, samples that are using in fishing medium. Uh, because of this scattering, uh, light has a limited uh, death penetration. And to avoid this, uh, you, you need to use um, destructive methods, uh, such as histology, which requires very specialized skills, and uh, using staining to, to highlight the, this uh, biological features you want to see. And uh, overall, also, is the limited volumetric integration that you have of the constant because these at the end rely on a few thin uh, uh, sections of uh, history. So, now turning to this, uh, we came up with the idea of a uh, image, uh, which is an alternative to optic based methods. And what ultra image is, is a, a versatile platform and software for the non invasive image of biomaterials and cell protein structures. And some of the advantages to optic methods is the greater depth penetration than optic microscopy. Um, it's suitable for non-processed materials. Uh, it does not require some sort of preparation and it's non-invasive. And most importantly, it allows you for volumetric imaging uh, with microscopic resolution. And with this, you can get uh, beautiful images in full dimension of the constructs and uh, um, also, ultrasonic data can be related to the key biological and physical properties, and also they have a uh, good fidelity to microscopy images. Um, one important step on the development of ultra image was the validation of the ultra image signal processing method, uh, which is the reference pattern method for the ultrasonic uh, imaging of uh, thin dynamic constructs. And with this sketch, I try to uh, highlight the idea that with one phantom, uh, we can uh, measure uh, thin dynamic constructs, uh, which, vary, vary, which may vary in attenuation and sound speed and, depth, uh, and, and focal depth with uh, respect to the phantom. And when I measure Melchior uh, thin dynamic constructs, it might represent the cellular formation in my scaffolds, where we have a change of large changes of attenuation or sound speed. Uh, also, when looking at the uh, bio scaffold with biodegradation or looking at morphological changes. So, all this is covered now in this uh, manuscript uh, where we, we validated the, the method. And uh, in particular, for some speed mismatch, we have developed a compensation function uh, that compensates for the large uh, errors as the phantom and sample deviating in, in uh, some speed mismatch. So with this method, we can now start to talk about standardized quantitative ultrasound imaging, where we will be using a generic uh, silver phantom and introduce the sound speed comp uh, mismatch compensation. So we can start to have a, a standardization of, of the ultrasonic results, uh, not only compared between us, but hopefully uh, this will be picked up by all, all the research groups and, and unify the, the evaluation of uh, the ultrasonic evaluation of conflict. So these and uh, other uh, improvements, we have now a, a very powerful and versatile uh, uh, software um, for the 
uh, the southern characterization of, of um, uh, teaching and constructs. So starting with uh, uh, with a 3D construct, we can look at compass times of thickness, some speed of attenuation. With this, we can generate uh, power attenuation and some speed compensated uh, intensity images. Uh, we can then touch them together to, to build a 3D image where we can look in different orientation, we can look at the morphology, and also we can navigate through the different intensities that compose the, the global uh, image. We can also access to the virtual uh, two-dimensional slices and perform uh, image analysis in the form of uh, histograms. And, uh, and all together, we feel a, a, a lot of freedom to, to evaluate the process. So with these methods, we have tested a, a range of applications in today, always highlighting you know, the, the non-invasive capability of this example. So one application is the uh, acoustic appreciation of our materials. Uh, this, broadly speaking, it's just looking at the sound speed uh, of the materials, which can be uh, uh, related to the stiffness of the material. Um, you could also look at the accessory matrix deposition in terms of sound speed increase, but also you can use it for uh, monitoring allergy degradation, which um, you will typically do it by extracting methods. Um, uh, an interesting application for trimets is the ability to uh, quantify uh, an, 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 an image cell density distribution in a wild scaffold. These are physical cells uh, captured over 72 hours. And what is nice of um, ultrasound, ultrasound and, and ultra image is because it's non-invasive and we have precision stages, you can come back to the same coordinates and look at the local uh, um, so the similar coordination look at the local uh, growth of that particular region. Um, also, another application is with the use of um, mathematical models. Uh, we can determine the, the cell cluster size um, developing in, in these cells. These are physical cells that are uh, tumor cells. So in, in this case, we demonstrate the possibility to use ultrasound for modeling tumors, for example. And here is the accessory matrix formation. This is an application we are looking at the moment. And this we are uh, investigating by scaffolds and, and cell steroids, developing ECM, as we talk more later. Uh, interesting application also is the structural evaluation of polyphyte constructs, which can be beneficial for optimizing uh, viability parameters and comparing to the CAD model and, and verify the uh, viability. And more recently, we are looking at uh, ex vivo tissues uh, for evaluating tissue scarring or burns with the use of ultrasound. So, starting with the uh, uh, monitoring near cartilage formation by scaffolds, this is the result of a very successful uh, collaboration with uh, Melbourne, with uh, Carmine and, and Serena, where they provided a range of scaffolds with very different uh, compositions and cultures over different uh, times. So they provide the biosculpture with very different uh, uh, degrees of neocartilage formation, as you can see in the microscopy, where the 10% was less benefited in the microenvironment compared to the 6%, which was the, the optimized uh, formulation. And then we, when comparing with ultrasound, we, we saw we were very happy about, the, about these images because they, they show a remarkable uh, similarity to microscopy respect. Uh, despite the differences in, in resolution. So what is nice of ultra image is that we can generate three images of the bus couples in the full dimension. You can see here for the 6% and then 8 and 10%. Uh, you can see uh, changing changes uh, in the images as a function of, of the concentration. But we were still unsure which which index, intensity index, index should you be looking in order to really uh, determine what is the, where is the expression matrix. So for that, I came up with the idea of performing volumetric histograms over the construct, and you can see a uh, monotonic increase over all the different sensitivities, uh, benefiting the 6%, but still it's not clear enough uh, which, if there is any intensity, uh, more significant. Um, with this, you can perform the ratio or the percentage increase with respect to the ratio, and here we identify 
the intensity minus 2.4 as the most significant. And now we uh, uh, can now monitor and quantify the special matrix being formed in the constructs. And this can be correlated with uh, uh, common neighbor markers, and this show a great uh, correlation. And now you can use this intensity to perform a selective ultrasonic of cartilage, which is a, 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 a fit advantage, advantage for uh, tissue engineering, as it allows you to look directly where is the ultrasonic being formed. Another example here is uh, similar with, uh, with cell steroids. Uh, you see at the bottom left is the tiny uh, cell steroid, uh, and uh, it also highlights the non invasive character of ultrasound. We were able to monitor the, the development of ECM on the same uh, cell steroid over a month. And similar before, you, you can uh, look at the subspeed changes, the morphology, you can see the volume size increase as, as expected, and also look at the inner microstructure. And similar before, we I also uh, identified the uh, significant band, uh, similar to as before, and this gave me the confidence to be able to try by track. And these were also correlated with the um, UPCR. These were sample provided by this one chunk, and we still uh, under development. Another example, just finishing soon, uh, is the monitoring of target cell activation by ultrasound. This is a uh, work being uh, done with Emma James and Eva and, and uh, Jamie, where we are using ultrasound to see the, the actuation of, of cardiac cells on in situ on, on, on the DSC. Uh, this will typically have to be done with focal microscope uh, with many more um, you know, uh, operations and, and, and instrumentation. So what, if you follow the cables, please. In the red cycle, circle the, the, the probe, uh, looking at the spheroid. We can generate a 3D image of the cell spheroid, and we can uh, look um, over a scan line and then monitor over time because if the, the cardiac cells are beating, beating, you can see a deviation of the frequency envelope over time, differently to the red, red line. This, uh, then you can look at the different region of interest, for example, here at the, at the start, and then you can zoom in, and then you can see the, the beating uh, over time of the cardiac cell. And this opens up new possibilities of research, not only for, not only for cardiac cells, but also uh, for muscle activation, for example. And one last uh, example is the evaluation of ultrasound for ex vivo tissues, in this case, uh, breast burn skin. Um, this, uh, the, the idea of this project is because um, many uh, studies are conducted on, on, on uh, pigs where they are sacrificed just to have uh, extract a, a, a small portions of, of the skin. So the idea was if we could use ultrasound to uh, evaluate the skin properties and avoid the, the sacrifice and, and with these animals, and also has many possibilities in the medical space as well. So looking at the local attenuation, you can see that the normal skin presents a high uh, attenuation. And when looking at the damaged skin, we, we can see a, a, a plastic change in the local attenuation. And similarly as before, we can perform an attenuation histogram, and you can see that the histogram is, is, has significant uh, changes between normal and, and damage, and then you can perform an analysis of the Gaussian properties, and from here you can perform a ultrasound tissue classification based on the Gaussian uh, properties, and here we uh, can classify the tissue properties based on, on, on with using ultrasound without having to sacrifice the, the animal. So this is something relevant. So finally, I would like to thank uh, ACES for the constant support developing this project, the collaborators along the way, uh, especially for providing samples because otherwise this would not be possible. And uh, if you're interested to collaborate, please contact me. Thank you. So there's a question from Maria on the track uh, on the chat. Great work. Interesting to see ultrasound being used so effectively. I know it is used in non-destructive testing of infrastructure. Do you know if it could be useful in battery interrogation? 
Um, There's a hell of a question. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I want to say yes. Uh, uh, Pastan is uh, ideal for soft tissues because of the, if you use a hard material, most of the ultrasound intensity will be uh, scattered back and, and it's, it's hard to penetrate solid materials. Okay, so just to follow up on that, but what about like the interface, you know, between the soft electrolyte and the electrolyte? Um, I haven't seen anything related, related but yeah, we'll see. The, the, um, an important parameter is acoustic impedance. So if you are having a change of the density or sound speed, you will, you should see a change in the, in the signal. Maria makes the comment that it's used in hard materials for infrastructure, for example, air blanketing. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, the, the time of travel, yes. Things like that, yeah. yeah. Okay. I could look into that. I think there's a qualified yes, Maria. So I think TO is again, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. All right, there's nothing on the chat. Um, so we'll move on. Thanks very much, and Grace. Thank you. Thank you. So our last session in this uh, first of the um, sessions today is, in, is the Equity and Diversity Committee, which is uh, Linda uh, Hancock, Linda Wallashine, Eliza and Jeremy. Now I guess we've got Linda here, um, Jeremy here, and uh, Eliza and, and Linda will be on uh, the screen, which we do have. So uh, I'll let them go ahead with the uh, gender uh, and COB reporting. Thanks, Dan. Um, um, oh, oh, you've already got it up. Fantastic. Yes, this is great. Thank you. It saves me having to do it. Okay. Does everyone want to have a regal? You know? <laughs> Look, as you know, this um, committee was set up once the project was going. And so it's unlike the Castro project, the um, Centre for Excellence, uh, that was set up and as a condition of it applying for Centre of Excellence. It, set up this sort of reporting. So, you know, we started this project with 25 CIs and five are, are women. Look, I'm just going to flip through some of these figures because my other colleagues on the committee and Jeremy's here in the audience here. The idea here is to think, okay, this is where we've come in this project and what does it say about in the future um, where we might go? So just the following slides are basically on gender, and then there's one at the end. And this is um, self-identified gender. You might um, recall a survey across the whole membership. So that's the number of ACES members um, in 2015, um, and in 2020, 104. So, you know, obviously we've grown, um, and that's 36% um, female. Um, and so that's the data sheet that we compiled this out of. I must acknowledge my colleague Linda Wallachine for her sterling work too on the figures. Um, and so this is again the number, but more importantly, the percentages. And uh, this gives you um, just a summary really in terms of comparing point in time 2015 and 2020. And so you can see in terms of some of these aren't as relevant, the um, advisory committee and the CIs, but here the number of PhDs um, increased. Um, so you can see that um, this is the number and more particularly the percentage. So um, these are more important probably than the raw numbers, but it shows that you know, we've had quite a good representation of females in this category, research fellows, which is about going to the next step in careers. So that's pretty positive in terms of being proactive in the STEM agenda, which you'd be aware of, and what the Academy of the Sciences is trying to do here. PhDs and ECRs, you can see that, um, you know, it, it is quite a problem in these areas, attracting 
more women, but maybe we've done well in terms of some of the other benchmarking um, nationally. So I guess this is a work in pro pro progress, um, but certainly some of the other points to come out in a minute. We'll talk more about the sort of cultures of the organisations that we work within and whether they're facilitating or cause barriers to some of these more emancipatory agendas. We're a pretty good project in terms of reaching out internationally. And I can thank Sam for this graphic um, because in terms of our PhDs, which we might equate with um, student training, you know, we've got a pretty good kind of global spread there. So that's great because, you know, some of these you here <laughs> um, come from these countries and I know amongst the CIs too, there's people who were born outside of Australia. So this is a very important part, I think, of how we can see uh, our legacy and how we've got an international group because what we do is international and we've also got um, our partner investigators in some of these countries and uh, we also publish with them. So that's all I'm going to say because I know I want to involve you. Um, first of all, are there any comments from the room or those online just about this sort of snapshot? Linda, do you have an explanation as to why the RFs are female dominated? Uh, well, <laughs> I think EPI might have a bit to do with that. You know, our own ethics policy and engagement group is more, has been more female. So if you took us out, which I haven't done, because I think it would be not as good a picture. <laughs> <laughs> and we're not basically from STEM, we're from, you know, other yeah. disciplines that are more in the humanities. So that's something, but looking around the room, you know, we're a, a, a mixed bunch. And that's what we want, you know. Yeah. And was it broken down into nodes as well? Uh, we did have that, but you know, you can imagine it gets to be a bit of a complicated yeah, feature. Yeah. yeah, but some were um, different compared with others. I suppose what it means is that when we have a centre for excellence, there's firstly the thought that goes into setting it up, then the recruitment process of the first one is really trend setting and important because that's where we advertise, how we market those positions is important. And a lot of the work around um, how these um, unconscious bias decisions get embedded is because we go to who we know. Oh, do you know anyone who might want a position in X? And we do the same, it's kind of human nature and you, you, know, you want to put it out there. So, that's the challenge, I think, reaching into non-traditional areas or recruitment possibilities and finding that involvement in a new project. I presume we don't really have 30% of our people from Mauritius, but I think that should be one or three or something. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'd better go. <laughs> that's <laughs> where the numbers are. <laughs> answer that one. <laughs> any other comments from the room? Um, I've not got it on. Are there any chats coming up there? I'll let you know. Thanks, David. Okay. No, All right. There is one from Adam Sarah. So I was just in another talk where they were monitoring people's rates. Have we got stats on that or Indigenous background? Yeah, we're pretty low on Indigenous. <laughs> it's pretty non-existent, I think. Um, but I guess this is this one up here is a bit of worries. Yes, certainly. Um, yeah, race is a tricky one. Again, you get into, yeah. Uh, but, I mean, the projects that have more embeddedness in Indigenous, obviously, then are able to recruit better. Um, some of them, which might be located in Western Australia or Northern Territory, for example. I mean, we have to think that when we advertise for positions, people, if they're from elsewhere, have to move. What do we do in terms of facilitating living allowance, for example, for people who might come from remote and regional even, you know? So there's some of the things that we have to think of. You might think of yourself as regional in terms of some metrics here in Wollongong, but then in terms of, you know, Sydney coming down and buying real estate and everything, 
you know, there's a lot of commuting. So anyway, but rural and regional needs more out there than in here. Okay, I'm going to quickly hand over to Linda now and uh, let you make your points about this and then Eliza. Sure, thanks Linda. Um, it was just sort of um, a continuation from uh, the webinar that we hosted uh, late last year, um, which was uh, on the topic of uh, COVID and um, early career researchers and PhDs, the, how they've been affected and how to overcome some of the key, uh, I guess, barriers now extra imposed through the pandemic. And um, I thought it was a good sort of uh, point for discussions maybe to uh, to think back to that webinar um, and now that we've sort of seen the ACES numbers to have have a think about that in the context of uh, of the center and um, so one key point that stood out and that I remember was that the um, uh, uh, groups most affected by most affected by the pandemic were uh, PhDs and early um, and mid uh, stage career researchers, especially those with um, parenting um, uh, um, response, like with caring responsibilities. So, some of the strategies that they were um, that were that were talked about was to sort of um, think about contract extensions or uh, con contract conversions from from part time to full time and vice versa. So. One question I thought I would put out into the room is sort of how to can like how to or whether there's a um, whether there's a sort of role for thinking about those um, groups that uh, are often affected by precarious employment, even outside of pandemics, how to um, mitigate those um, precarious employment conditions from the start of a new center. So what are strategies to overcoming or mitigating, mitigating precarious employment? And then also um, for, for the um, PhDs and early career researchers, um, what is the role of having mentors, like female mentors or be, being part of a mentorship program or a network, uh, a women's network to, to sort of help uh, plan and um, maybe sort of uh, progress within careers. So those were just a couple of reflections um, to think about and maybe to discuss so the strategies and also the importance of um, mentors in planning and overcoming those barriers. Yeah. Okay, any sort of points in this room? Like who's an ECR here who might feel that COVID's been a pretty difficult time in terms of the career? like access to labs and everything on Zoom, can't go overseas, can't travel for an internship. Are there people here who found themselves in this, like feeling that it's been a, a tough time? We wore on Zoom. Sorry? That's what we wore on the Zoom. Yeah, we're, we're on the Zoom. Zoom. What about? Yeah, certainly so, from, from down in Melbourne, it's been pretty tough. Um, yeah, yeah I mean, longer. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm more a little bit more senior now, but certainly for a lot of the early career people starting out, and and really for PhD students, it's been very tough from Melbourne. Um, yeah, so um, there's a lot of anxiety among students and early career researchers, that <coughs> and um, some universities are handling that better than others. Yeah, thanks for that. The, I think the Academy found that too in their specific report. Um, you know, so we're going to need to be mindful about that in recruitment, for example, you know, that there mightn't be the same sort of completion rate or, you know, other metrics for people who, it, it may be that moving forward when we advertise going forward that we might have a special category for making a case that how you were affected by COVID, for example, because some were affected or have been more than others. Um, and some have been luckier. Yeah, thanks for that. Any other comments from Linda's point? Um, I mean, being an ECR isn't easy anyway. 
and certainly with the other constraint, of course, is national funding, isn't it? And the decline of international students. Um, I went to a meeting at Deakin the other week, which was trying to bring together Deakin researchers in energy uh, in terms of industry grants and ways of moving forward because of constraints on the university in terms I'm of- do you name a Sorry? Oh, that was random. Okay, let's move to Eliza, because Eliza, you're going to talk more about the institutional and cultural factors we need to be mindful of. Thanks, Linda. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I had a couple of uh, points of reflection um, and a recommendation. Uh, we focused a lot on the numbers here. And that's in part because that's exactly what the ARC asked us to do when they um, encouraged at the last review of the centre that we set up the Equity and Diversity Committee. Um, but there's a lot of evidence that attention to, merely attention to looking at numbers and focus, uh, strategies which focus on trying to fix the numbers, um, these alone won't actually make change and foster equity and diversity. So we need to attend to more than just these quantitative measures. Although it's important to track numbers, um, as well, if we don't do that, we won't know where we are. But in addition to focusing on the numbers, we also need to focus on two other things. One is um, the institutions themselves, and this has two aspects, the culture of institutions, are they chilly? Are they perhaps excluding um, of people of different backgrounds and uh, different genders? Uh, and in addition to the culture of institution, just the mechanisms of institutions. So Linda referred to this a little bit before when she talked about, um, select, uh, she didn't talk about selection panels, but hiring practices, selection panels, um, given the metrics of excellence with publishing, so the gender composition of editorial panels. So there's those kinds of things we need to look at. So fixing the culture of institution in addition to fixing the numbers. But there's also another dimension that needs to be focused on. And there's quite a lot of work now coming out of um, Stanford on uh, gender innovations in science. And so um, people that are looking in this area are looking at actually the gendering of disciplinary knowledge. So the key concepts and methods of any particular discipline and how they might actually function to exclude or marginalise different voices. Um, so in addition to fixing the numbers, we need to look at the institutions themselves, um, the, the environment in which um, research takes place, and that needs to also include the disciplinary uh, knowledge environment. Um, another thing that I think is very important is we focus on the research climate and the researchers. But what's also important to focus on in any equity and diversity plan is the end users of the technology. Um, and so to properly fulfill equity and diversity agendas, we need to consider the users of the technology um, and include them early in the research timeline and also appropriately embed users of technology in the research agenda. So either as um, advisors or co-researchers. And lastly, the recommendation. Um, Linda mentioned this also, that the Equity and Diversity Committee came in quite late um, in the history of, of ACES. And so in order to successfully embed principles of equity and diversity, um, an equity and diversity plan, which takes account of a number of the dimensions that I've, I've just raised and have been raised throughout the presentation, so it needs to be implemented at the inception of any CEO or Centre of Excellence, including the new centre that will be proposed. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Eliza. And Jeremy, Jeremy, um, a point that I didn't go over was the policies that our committee started off putting in place, like the uh, Code of Conduct and the conference policy. Sorry, where is Jeremy? There you are, here. Okay, so, uh, you had some points you wanted to make, and maybe you can allude to the other work we did because this was just really a reporting. Sure, Linda. So, um, yeah, we didn't have So, I guess I just wanted to pose a question, and it relates to uh, really what Eliza uh, just raised then, and that is really what have we learned? 
uh, from the ACES experience in terms of uh, potential barriers and enablers uh, for equity diversity. I put the question to everybody, but I'd be particularly keen, uh, Gordon, to get your response to that you know, as director. And I guess it's important in terms of uh, looking ahead to future centres of excellence, you know, how they can benefit from the ACES experience. Cool. Well, I'll kick it off. <laughs> so I, I totally agree with uh, the comment that things need to be part of the planning process, you know, that it needs to be brought in there, even the expression of interest level. Right and I think it will be looked at very closely by the NRC this time around. So getting started early and having a very comprehensive plan, uh, I think is, is very important. Uh, and I need to keep monitoring the, you know, the progress towards how those things are, are being implemented. Because just having the plan and not having active engagement from the, from the, the community either. So I, I think that we've uh, put things in place and have improved things uh, in terms of our own uh, performance. But as Linda says, that, that you know, was from the, what, three years we went, we were already three years in. Mm. So things could be a lot better going right from the plan. I mean, one thing we can do in the new expression of interest, for example, is say that we've got these policies in place and you know, we can review them. Um, I don't know whether people were aware, but in our, in our conference policy, we actually you know, worked alongside the conference organisers and said, OK, what's the gender mix like on our conference session chairs? And then another thing is who asks the first question? Because quite often it's someone with a lot of confidence. And so the other thing we can think about is that conferences taking a question from a man and then a woman, you know, in order to make the stand that it's important because people hang back or to make sure that an ECR, for example, asks the first question because quite often we're only taking one or two questions. And so it's about having voice and authenticity um, acknowledged um, and people who might be shy but very have very good questions being able to yeah, speak out and speak up. Yeah, and just going back on, on Jerry's well, I, I guess you've got to still like to get as many ideas and the answer to that question as much as possible over the next few weeks in terms of putting everything together of what we have. That's true. What we have yeah. I mean, if they can email yeah. any of us if you've got ideas about what you think are the steps forward and how we can learn from our own experience. I mean, another one might be a really tricky area and it's not only a gender one, it's about status and it's probably the elephant in the room that quite often if you don't get on with your boss, who do you complain to? And that's come up in Parliament House, for example, you know, hasn't it, in recent controversies um, in the sense that if the person who's your supervisor is being a bit problematic, how can you work to get some mediation or um, who can you go to who's outside who could maybe smooth things over, make it better before it blows up? Because, you know, no one wants that. Can I just ask a comment or question about the concept of unconscious bias and how, how do we address that as an individual and also within an institution? I think as Gordon said, training would help because I think people tend to sometimes think that they're very inclusive, that sometimes the language they use can come across as completely un, uh, unconscious bias. And to me, I, I, that's a real hard one for me to, to know whether when I write an application for a post position or something and advertise it, am I doing bias? I, I don't know. In terms of um, putting together position descriptions um, at Deakin, for example, we've got people we can run it by and say, can you put this through the lens, please? Yeah. But I mean, in some ways I can't believe I used the word because I don't like it. Because, you know, it, it, a friend of mine who was in charge of equity for a big company, and she was Irish and had a great sense of humour. But she said, oh, unconscious bias, you know, oh, I didn't know I was being discriminatory. That was her sort of, not about herself, yeah. but about what she was seeing mm -hmm. in the organisation. Because to say you weren't conscious of it, it might be unconscionable behaviour, because you should be, should you know? Be. Yeah. So what should we be aware of that unconsciously we're not aware of? 
And that's a different thing yeah. to exonerating or excusing behaviour that now in this day and age we ought not to be falling into. So that's the sort of thing I think it's like walking on a bit of a fence that's a bit rickety. Yeah. Um, so. <clears throat> Just to follow up on the unconscious bias, I mean, the IE served on the promotions committee, and as a requirement of sitting on a committee, I had to do a short course on unconscious bias. Yeah. And it was quite an interesting course to do as well. But it really comes down to taking the time to think it through, to ask the question. And actually, prior to even doing the course, um, I probably would never ask the question or thought about it unless you're, you're aware of it. I don't know if people online can hear that point that was made, but it's a great one, that if you do training in unconscious bias, it can open your eyes. Mm -hmm. And I am smiling a bit because those ads about the people in the lift and the bias that comes out in that interaction um, is quite an eye-opener, you know. So if you haven't done unconscious bias um, training, they're just online modules available on YouTube or anywhere, but through your university, it's probably a good idea. Um, Linda and Eliza, did you have any points you wanted? I think we're going to wind up in a minute. David's the timekeeper and doing a good job there. Any other points you would like to make? Nothing additional to what's been said, no. Yeah. Well, thanks for bringing up about Stanford because anyone can Google it and have a look. I think that's a good idea. And Linda, thanks for bringing up about the ECR and COVID because, you know, it's the environment we're living in and hopefully moving out of soon. Um, and so thanks, everyone, for your participation. And Join with me in thanking the... Uh, Sorry, Linda, I have a very conscious bias towards time here. <laughs> um, so that brings uh, to the end of our uh, first session.